All right, guys. So welcome back to uh, the video. Um, I'm gonna start part two here. We're gonna continue our discussion of these uh, search algorithms, right? So the previous video, we introduced this idea of agents that were performing searches uh, to find a solution, and the solution was a sequence of actions that led <clears throat> the agent from the initial state to the goal state, right? So this is all taking place in the agent's mind. It hasn't taken any actions in the real world yet, right? In its environment. Um, what it's doing is it's coming up with a plan. It's coming up with a solution that is a sequence of actions by playing out all the different scenarios, by generating all the possible um, states <clears throat> um, of the environment one at a time and trying to connect all those states together through actions that lead, you know, that create a path from the start state to the goal state, okay? So we were gonna start talking about um, a couple of different algorithms, one called tree search and one called graph search. So these two algorithms here um, are kind of like a high level um, description of two broad categories of um, of searches. So tree search, um, the, the big thing about tree search is that it doesn't keep a record of where it's been. In other words, um, you're going to be going through and generating nodes, which are storing states dynamically on the fly as the search progresses. Okay. And so the tree search doesn't keep track of states that it's um, generated already. Okay. So what this means is, is that a tree search could end up with a loopy path, right? Where, you know, you've um, gone down a branch of the tree and you're generating new states as you go uh, for each node in that branch. And you could end up um, generating duplicate states. So you could have multiple states in different nodes and, you know, those states, if you apply actions to them, might lead you back to a state that was already previously generated. And so you end up with kind of a loop. And so tree search doesn't really have anything to deal with that. Okay. Graph search does. Okay. Graph search is the search algorithm that keeps a list of that um, set of explored states, right? So a state is going to be stored in a node, a node is part of our data structure. Okay, and this data structure is generating our state space dynamically on the fly by using all those pieces that we looked at before. You know, the result function, the action function, and so on. Okay, so what I was gonna do here is I'm gonna go through each one of these algorithms, trace through it with you, draw you a picture as, you know, demonstrating how this thing works in general. And uh, then we'll then we'll go from there. I also want to do another example of generating a state space um, that will uh, be similar to what you're going to do for your homework assignment. Okay, for this or for your uh, next homework assignment, or for one of your next homework assignments. Anyway, okay. All right. So let's go ahead and trace through this here. Take a look at it. Um, so remember. And we have to define our problem, which is going to be um, an implementation of, or is going to include an implementation of the actions function, the results function, the goal test function, the initial state. Okay. And so remember what the results function does, takes an action in a state and then returns the updated state. So an existing state plus an action equals a new state, right? Um, and the actions function takes a state and then returns a list of all the valid actions that could be done from that state. Goal test function accepts a state as an argument and then returns true or false. True if it's a goal, if it's the goal state, false otherwise. Okay, and uh, so the uh, algorithm has to have access to, um, to all of that. Okay, what, however you want to implement this, write a function for it, method, whatever, all those other pieces have to be here. Now the textbook right here is trying to give us, you know, a high level intro to, you know, the, 
the, the, the, the approach of, of doing a tree search as opposed to the, the, the approach of doing a graph search. And um, the tree search, no memory, doesn't keep track of states that it's generated previously. Okay, so you can end up having uh, loops in this particular algorithm. Now, if you were to, um, you know, construct your problem in such a way that loops could never be generated, well, then who cares, right? But um, if if it's possible that you could repetitively generate the same states over and over and over again during your search, then you're going to want to use the graph search um, version of this or the graph search algorithm because it does keep track of states that you've generated in the past. And, um, you know, if you go to generate a, a, a repeat, um, it just discards the repeat and you continue on with your, with your day. Anyway, so we're going to go through this and, um, remember we talked about this thing called the frontier and, uh, you know, if I was going to be coding this in C++, I'd probably make the frontier, um, I'd make it a, uh, like a vector, you know, cause you need it to be able to grow as, as, as much as you, as you needed to, um, because you don't know how many states or you'd have to keep in, you'd have to keep in mind how many states you could possibly generate from any particular, um, state, right? What you'd have to be thinking about, well, okay, well, how many actions can I have from this particular state? Because each action that you have from a particular state is going to determine how full your frontier is going to get essentially. Um, so if you can guarantee that you only generate so many child nodes and therefore so many states, then, you know, you could make your frontier fixed in size, but using a vector might make it easier or a list in Python. And that's what they use. I think if I remember correctly, either a, a list or a set, some kind of sequence in Python is what they use in their Python code. All right. Anyway, so you got that frontier. And so let's just go through and, um, see how this works. Okay. Get an idea for how it, how it goes. So, you know, it says it started off here. It starts off here by saying, you know, initialize the frontier using the initial state of the problem. Okay. So remember we were defining the initial state, um, within that whole problem definition, as I was just saying a second ago, you know, you got your first, your start state, you know, as, as well as your fun, your actions function and your results function. Okay. So I'll just call that state, um, state one. Okay. So this would be like a node. I'd define it with a struct, you know, and, um, so these nodes are going to contain, um, four things as we're going to see here in a second, they're going to have a state that they are, um, responsible for knowing. So state one, whatever that might be, state one might be vacuum world, you know, um, might be representation of vacuum in the left square, square dirty, other square empty, no dirt, you know. Um, and then whatever action led to this state. Now, if it's the very first state, there is no action that led to it, right? So that's going to be null. So I'll just make a little no, little zero there for null. So no actions caused this state to come into being because this state was the first state that the agent, or the current state that the agent finds itself in. And so it's trying to generate additional states so that way you can think ahead into the future and make a, make a plan, make, find a solution to, to, to what it wants. And so you're trying to go from this, from this initial node and generate a whole bunch of series of nodes, creating a tree that eventually you'll have a leaf that's a node that's holding your goal state. And then you just trace through that tree from start state to goal state where each edge is representing an action. And then that sequence of actions is going to make up your, um, it's going to make up your uh, solution. All right. Anyway, so this is our frontier. And as I was saying, you know, I would just make this like a vector. Um, and then you dynamically allocate this node before you even start this algorithm, right? Because you defined it as part of your problem. The problem has to be pre-existing. And so, you know, you can store that memory address of that node in the frontier. You could make copies of it, but that would be more, that'd be more wasteful. Okay. And so then a loop starts If the frontier is empty, then return failure. So as it turns out, if the frontier is ever empty, then, um, that means that you've created all the nodes that you could possibly create. Remember each node is going to store a state. That means that you've generated all the possible states, you know, for every state that you come up with, you consider what all the actions are from that and all the states that lead from that state, according to those actions. 
So you've played it out. You generated your entire state space. You didn't find a solution. That's what it means if the frontier is empty. Now, in terms of a tree, that would mean that all of your leaves in that tree, there's no state in any of those nodes in the leaves that represents your goal. Okay, your goals test function never ever evaluates to um, to true. Okay, so if the uh, frontier is empty, return failure, um, and then choose a leaf node and move it from the frontier. Now, the order in which you choose these nodes is going to determine the characteristics and the performance and how the how the algorithm actually develops, right? We're going to see different versions of these algorithms um, in a little bit, and they're going to revolve around, um, you know, what order do you pull things out of the frontier? You know, do you pull them from the front of the tier, frontier, the back of the frontier? Do you, do you assign a priority, you know, um, to each of the nodes? And so the, whoever has the highest priority comes out, um, what do you, what do you do? And that's going to determine the character of, of, of how the search progresses. Give me away. So I choose a leaf node and remove it from the frontier. So, you know, I'd, if this was C++, you know, I'd have a temporary pointer, you know, and then uh, I'd go through here and, um, you know, remove that pointer from my vector, you know, pop front or something. And then uh, there it says, uh, if the node contains a goal state, then return the corresponding solution. Okay, so, you know, let's say that my goal state is five, okay, it's state five, whatever five is. Okay, um, whatever that represents. Well, then I, f I would feed into my goal test function. This is going to look gross. Um, GT, sorry, I still got my map going. I'd be feeding one into that goal test function, right, which I wrote ahead of time. And um, it's going to return true or false. Well, in this case, it's going to return false because one is not my goal state, right? State five, whatever that might represent, checkerboard, chessboard, you know, the queens arranged a certain way on the on the uh, board, whatever. Um, this particular state, which I'm referring to as one, is not this particular state, which I'm referring to as five. So that would return false. Um, so then it says here, you know, so, you know we're not going to be returning the corresponding solution because there isn't a solution because it's not a goal state. So then expand the chosen node, adding the resulting nodes to the frontier. Okay. So... Um, that node becomes our root node, okay? Becomes our root node in the tree, okay? Okay, so now what does it mean when it says expand um, the chosen node? What that means is, is create all of its children that you need. Okay, so we're gonna have that actions function, which I'll call A, right? Now, if we have already written that because it was part of our problem definition, then the input, remember the input to the actions function is some state. Now what comes out of that uh, function, what's it return? It returns a list of all of the legal actions that you can take from that state. So, you know, let's call it actions A, B, and C, okay? So whatever that might be, in, in vacuum world, it was left, right, suck, right? So maybe A is left, B is right, C is suck. Okay, fine. Um, and so then what you do is you use your results function and we'd need to use that three times. What goes into the results function? The state and then an action, right? Now, what uh, comes out of the results function? A new state, right? So action A applied to state one moves you into action or into a state two, right? So your environment changes or transitions from state one to state two through action A. One plus A equals two. In other words, a state plus an action equals a new state, okay? Um, and so at that point, that would have generated a new state, which we'd have to store inside of a node, okay? Uh, let's see here. And so we would add that to our frontier. What was the action that caused state two to come into being? It was action A. And you'd have to repeat that process for every single action. 
So you'd be feeding state one and action B into your results function, and that would get you um, state three. Um, and then you would also um, feed state one and action C into your results function, and that would get you state um, three, okay? All right, expand the chosen node, adding the resulting nodes to the frontier, right? So that would mean that we would have had, also had state three and state four. Okay, so those are all added to the frontier. Okay. Um, so now, Um, you go back up to the top of the loop. If the frontier is empty, is it? No. Choose a leaf node and remove it from the frontier. So a similar kind of thing, right? So the order in which you choose them, that's going to determine how the algorithm works, right? Right now, just keep it simple. I'll just grab the first one. So then we'd be examining this guy, okay? So we removed it from the frontier. It would mean if I was in the C++, I removed its memory address from my vector, and then... Um, you know, use the temporary point and hold on to it. Um, so, is that containing my goal state? Let's say my goal state is five, right? So I'd feed state two into my goal test function and five's not two, so it would return false. So I'd continue on, continue on, continue on. And so then it says expand the chosen node, adding the resulting nodes to the frontier. Okay, so the, uh, each node that gets generated, in addition to storing the state in the action that caused it to come into being, that state to come into being, um, needs to keep track of the parent node, right? The node that spawned it. Okay, this will be important here in a second. So, because remember, each one of these each one of these edges between the nodes represents an action. What action? Action A, right? Action A plus state one equals state two. Okay, so it says here, uh, expand the chosen node, um, adding the resulting nodes to the frontier. So let's say that um, we expand this node or we try to, right? So that would mean that we feed two into that actions function and let's say that the action function returned null, right? In other words, there's no legal actions to take from state two, right? Well, then that subtree is done, right? That's a leaf. There's no goal there, and that, that path is, is, is terminated, okay? So then we would go back up to the top of the loop, and then we check the frontier again. Is it empty? No, there's, um, there's a state four here. I guess that's the next one in there, okay? So let's say... Um, that we grab that one. We have to remove it from the frontier. Okay. And then uh, we check it. Is this the goal state? No, because the goal state is five. So we feed um, state four into our actions function. Let's say that it also returns null. Okay. Well, then that means that, you know, that particular subtree, that part of our state space is at an end. Okay. So but we're keeping track of who our parents are. It's very important. Okay, oops. Now we go back to the frontier and we grab it, okay, and uh, remove it from the frontier, oops. And then we feed it state three into the goal test function. Goal test function says false because it's not five. And so then what do we do? Um, expand the chosen node. So let's say that we feed um, state three into our action function and it gives us um, action D and E. Actions D and E. Okay. So then we would take state three, action D, feed that into our results function, and then that would lead us to state five. Okay, and then if we were to feed um, three in action E into our results function, then we'll say that that would give us um, state six, okay? 
So those nodes would then be getting dynamically allocated. Node star n equals new node, right? And you'd be populating those nodes. Um, let's add this over to our tree here. OS3 ND. Okay. And you'd be populating with um, the state. You'd initialize with the state. The action that caused the state to get generated and um, the, the, the memory address of its parent. Okay, and if we were keeping track of path costs, we'd also do that too. Okay, so now we've got node five, which was generated by action D. We add that to the frontier. And then uh, we got the node with state six, action E generated it. We add that to the frontier. Okay. So we go back up to the top of the loop. Is the frontier empty? No. So then we choose a leaf node and remove it from the frontier. So I've just been grabbing the leftmost one. And then we say, well, does that node contain a goal state? Well, yeah, there it is, five. Okay. So algorithm's over. Return the corresponding solution. Okay. Now remember, we populated this thing with its parent's memory address. Okay. So the, the algorithm's over. So who cares about state six? We found our goal. Okay. Um, so we have a solution. We can go from state one to state five. State five is the solution, or uh, the goal, excuse me. So what's the solution? The series of actions that link those states, okay? Now this was, um, you know, C++, make sure you delete all of your nodes that you created, but. Um, so how do you put the, <clears throat> how do you put the, uh, the solution together? Well, the last node generated is your goal state node, right? It's that node which is storing the goal state. So you have the memory address for it. Remember, I was talking about these temp that temporary pointer. Okay. So start there and then treat it like a linked list. Follow the pointers, right? So follow the pointers and um, just build a list of all the actions along the way. So what action cause state five to get generated d how do i know it's stored in the node along with state five right so d and then move on to the next node okay what generated action um or uh, state three right i think that's supposed to be b and i don't know how to write <laughs> no no uh yeah that's supposed to be b and i just don't know how to write i don't know what the heck was i doing this is a yeah this is supposed to be a b i don't know how to write Apparently. Well, it's hard writing with the mouse. Okay, cut me some slack. Um, so as I'm traversing this list, that's what these pointers are helping me do. They're, they're basically making me a linked list, right? Um, so then I just store that in my little container over here, right? Maybe this is a vector also, right? Because it probably should be a vector because you don't know how long the, the solution is going to be. Um, and then I go to the root node, try to traverse to that. Well, that's state one. Well, there was no action that put me in my initial state. So I, this is null, right? Remember I said, let's make this null. So what's my solution? This is my solution, right? Salute. Um, so to get from state one to state five requires me to take actions B and D. That's it. And so that's the thinking part, right? The agent hasn't acted yet, right? The, none of these states have actually come into being. These are This is like a simulation. Okay, so now in the environment when it comes time to have the actuators do stuff this is what you use to tell the actuators to do stuff first take this action maybe if it's vacuum world move right and then take this action if it's vacuum world suck right so move right suck and so these are your that's your solution those are your actions that you should take okay all right so in that example you know i assumed that um my actions function you know, my problem definition through my actions function and my, um, my results function couldn't generate duplicate states. Okay, um, if, if, if that were possible, then you could end up in an endless loop or generating um, whole subtrees over and over and over and over again because you know you could generate state one, then state two, then state three, which leads to generating state one, then state two, then state three which leads to generating state one, then state two, then state three. Um, very wasteful, right? So the graph search algorithm tries to deal with this 
by adding uh, to the Frontier another container. And that container is keeping track of um, all of the uh, states or nodes that are holding those states that um, you've seen before, right? So that if you, know, you generate a state one, you know, and store that in a node, and then you generate a state two and store that in a node, generate a state three, and then um, store that in a node. If you then generate a state one again, you ignore it. And so that subtree gets cut off at that point. You're just like, okay, well, we've, we've been here before, just stop, okay? So in that case, repetition you know, built into, or potential repetition built into your problem definition, doesn't matter because as soon as the repetition is detected, because you know that you've already seen this, um, you just you just terminate that, that branch, you stop going down that branch. Okay, so let's go ahead and go through it. Um, so returning a solution or failure, and then you have the frontier just like before. Okay. And uh, we would have a results function, we'd have an actions function, we'd have a goal test function just like before. And so then, in addition to um, the frontier, you'd also have an uh, explored set, which I'll call X. Okay, and I'll try to keep this as clean as I can. Um, so explored is initialized to empty because you haven't generated any states yet. So as, as you generate states and put them inside of nodes, you know you're you're exploring them. You're visiting them. You're, 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 you've seen that state before. Okay. Now the frontier gets initialized with the initial state just like before. So let's say that that is state one. What caused state one to come into being? Uh, nothing. It's your initial state. There's no action that led to it. Okay. So here's your loop. If the frontier is empty, then return failure. Similar. Nothing new there. Choose a leaf node and remove it from the frontier. Okay. Use a temporary pointer again, you know, if you're doing this in C++ or however you want to do it, right? As long as you're following the algorithm, right? So that gets removed from the frontier, fine. Okay. Um, if the node contains a goal state, then return the corresponding solution. Let's say that our goal state is, I don't know, six. Okay, I'll just put six up here so to remind us, All right? If the node contains a goal okay. Otherwise, um, if it doesn't, then you're going to get past this return statement, right? The, the algorithm is going to continue marching on. So then add the node to the explored set. Add the node to the explored set. So when they say add the node to the explored set, right, you're keeping track of states. Okay, so the term between node and state is kind of blurry at this point, right? We're going to talk about it a little bit more here in a, in a minute, but remember a node is a structure um, that's storing some information, right? Struct node, okay? So what were we storing again? Representation of the state, representation of the action, um, the memory address of the parent, or reference to the parent, and if needs be, a cost, right? But for this example, we haven't keep track of any costs. Okay, so um, if you're dynamically allocating nodes, then you wouldn't be able to use your using memory addresses like I suggested with my Frontier. You wouldn't be able to just put the memory addresses in here because every single node would be have a different memory address, right? So this is really needs to keep track of states that you've that you visited. Okay, so maybe I'd put a representation of um, state one in here. Okay, um, add the node to the explored set and then expand the chosen node. Okay, adding the resulting nodes to the frontier. So let so what does that mean? Feed one into your action function, okay? And so let's say that that results in actions A and B, okay? Then what? In turn, you feed um, state one and action A into your results function. That would give us um, state two, okay? State two's got the memory address of its parent plus the node that generated it. It gets added to the frontier. And then we would take uh, state one and state B, pass that to our actions function, or excuse me, to our results function. And that would give us state three, which we initialize with the state representation, the actions representation, and then the memory address of the parent node, which I'm not drawing all the way across here just to keep things prettier or neater. 
Okay. Now here's the thing though. Here's the key part. Only if not in the frontier or explored set. That's how you eliminate your duplication. That's how you eliminate your loops. Only if not in the frontier or explored set. Well, um, state two and state three were not in the explored set and neither of them were in the frontier because they were just they were just added, right? So once that's done, you go back up to the top of the loop and you go well, again, right? So is the frontier empty? No. Choose a leaf. I'm just picking the ones at the beginning. Okay, remove it from the frontier. Okay, let me go put it over here to action A. And it's got the memory address of who spawned it. Okay, and then um, is that the goal? Is that my goal node? No, because I want, I, want, I want six, right? I want a node that contains state six. Right. Um, so then add the node to the explored set, add the state to the explored set. Right. I've examined it. I've checked it to see if it's my goal. It's not. So I've explored it. That's another way of looking at it. Um, expand the chosen node, adding the resulting nodes to the frontier. So let us say that we um, feed um, we feed state two into our action function. And let's say that the uh, action it gives us, I don't know, call it um, action J, okay? If you take action J and state two, right? And feed that into our results function. Let's say that that gives us state one, right? So in other words, it would be telling us, oh, well, we're undoing what we did to go back, you know, right? To go back to the previous state. So. You know, you expand that node, adding the result node, the resulting nodes. So one would be a resulting node. One would be a resulting state to the frontier only if not in the frontier. Well, it's not in the frontier, so that's okay. Or explored set. We see here, state one's already in the explored set. So guess what? This guy doesn't go to the frontier. Screw him. He's gone. Just delete him. Right? So the loop, right? Because if you didn't have that, Right in the uh, tree search algorithm, you'd be like, "All right, well, let's go ahead and do this." Right, and then that would go on. That would just keep repeating over and over again. Because remember, um, state one led to state two, which leads to state one, which would have led to state two, which would have led to state one, which would have led to state two. Okay, gross. Um, but with this, with graph search, it can't happen because state one was already in the explored set. See, see how that works. Okay, so. Um, all right, so go back up to the top of the loop. If the frontier is empty, then return failure. Well, it's not. We got uh, we got uh, the node with state three in it. Is that my goal? No. Um, so then add that state to the explored set. Oops. Okay. Don't forget we're removing. Oops. We're removing uh, node three. All right. The node that contains state three from the frontier. Okay. Um, is it my goal? No, because I'm going to look for state six. Um, so then what do we do? Um, we expand that chosen node, adding the result nodes to the, to the uh, frontier. So let's say that we feed three into the actions function and that provides us actions C and D. It takes action C and state three and you feed it into your results function and then that would give us state four, okay, which gets added to the frontier and that node as well as storing the state four is storing the action that caused it to be generated. Um, and then we feed action D and state three into our uh, results or yeah, into our results function, sorry. And uh, that gives us state five. So we create a node that's hold state five and action D, add it to the frontier go back up to the top. Now we can add them both to the frontier because four and five were not already in the frontier and neither of them were in the explored set. If either of them were already in the frontier or the explored set, then we would have just discarded the node that we just created. So that way we wouldn't be having a loop, right? Anyway, so go back up to the top. I'll just do one more iteration of this and then, uh, then we'll move on, okay? Um, if the frontier is empty, it's not. Choose a leaf node. So we're choosing four here. I'm just going from left to right, okay? Move from the frontier. Does it contain my goal state? No, my goal state six. Um, so then add that state 
it says node, but add the state for reasons I laid out. Do you want to explore it set? Okay, and uh, then we're going to expand that chosen node, adding the resulting nodes to the frontier only if it's not in the frontier of the set, right? So let's say that we took four and passed that to my actions function. The actions function gave us, I don't know, um, action G, okay? And so then um, we apply, um, we apply uh, state four and action G. We give that to our results function. And then let's say that that, um, gives us state five, okay? So would we create a node that we add to our frontier for a state five? No, because there's already one in the frontier. So we would just discard it, just delete it, okay? So state four, uh, crap, I can't remember if it was, I think it was a child of, it was a child of three here, right? If it was supposed to be off of one, I'm sorry, I, I lost my train of thought there. So we'll just say it was three, okay? Um, cool. So it's on the frontier anymore. So we go back up to the top. Um, frontier is empty, no. Choose a leaf node. Well, there's only one in here. Remove it from the frontier. Is that my goal? No. Um, so then what we're gonna do is we're gonna add that to the explored set, its state. Uh, and then we expand that node. So let's say that we feed five to our actions function and that returns state E and then, uh, or excuse me, action E. And then we feed five in E to our results function. And then that returns state six, okay? So do we add a node that has state six in it to the frontier or to the, uh, or to the frontier? Yes, we do, because there's no state six in the explored set, and there's no node that contains um, that contains uh, six in our frontier. So we go ahead and we create a node that has six in it in action E. That's in our frontier. Okay, and I think five was gonna be a child of this guy too, right? Okay, and again, if I, if I was supposed to do that up here, I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought, but you hopefully you get the idea, okay? Um, all right, so go back to the top of the loop. Is the frontier empty? Um, no. Choose the leaf node and move it from the frontier. Boom. If the node contains the goal state, then return the corresponding uh, solution. Yes, it does. So we'd feed six into our goal test function. Goal test function return true we have our solution. And remember that each node has a memory address of the parent that spawned it. Okay, so now we have to construct our solution. So what do we do? This is our head node, it's just like a linked list. We traverse the linked list going all the way back up to the very top of the structure. So our solution would contain what? Well, we start off at the first, you know, at that goal node, whose memory address we have because we just generated it. Um, and so what was the action that it was storing? E, right? Um, oops, what did I do here? That should have been D, right? Yeah, that should have been D, sorry about that. So E, and then we go to the parent node, get action D from there, go to its parent node, get action B from there, and then you go to its parent node. Well, there was no action that caused state one to come into being, so that is your solution. Now, since I went from bottom up, it's backwards, right? You don't um, go from state one and apply action E to it. Um, so, you know, we'd have to put this in reverse order or, or start the uh, inflammation of the solution from the from behind and then work our way. But this is actually the first action that you should take. And this is the second and this is the third. So start with your initial state, state one. From state one, you take action B. Okay, and then that transitions you into state three. And then in state three, you take um, action D and that gets you into state five. Okay, and then from state five, you take action E and that gets you to state six, which is your um, goal state, right? So remember, it's a two phase operation, right? The, the agent 
is doing its thinking and then its execution, right? It's searching phase and then its execution phase. So everything that I just drew up for you, that was part of the searching phase. And then once it has the solution, you know, all these actions would be fed into the actuators of the agent. And then that would solve the problem because then the agent would end up in the state of the world or, or yeah, in the, in the world state. That is uh, your goal is that you want the agent to be in, right? That's, that's your solution to the problem. Okay. All right. So hopefully I didn't lose you here. Hopefully I didn't misremember, you know, what level these were supposed to be on, but if I did, you, know, you get the idea. Okay. All right. Um, so let's continue on, continuing on just for a little bit longer here. Um, so I got to switch back over to my slides. All right. So that's how those work. And um, this figure in the text is just kind of giving you an idea of how the search progresses um, on that map of Czechoslovakia, right? So this is this pattern should look familiar. And if this is your initial state, okay, um, you know you go through the uh, tree search, and what do you end up with? Well, these are your nodes on the frontier, right? So this is your entire potential state space. Right? But in memory, you would only have four nodes after one iteration, right? Because you'd have your initial node and then you'd be generating these three on the fly, okay? And each of the contents or the, each state is generated by applying an action that's possible from this initial state um, to that initial state, right? So if the possible actions were go this way, go this way, go this way, Right, well, you take the state, feed it into your actions function. The actions function would say, you can go this way, go this way, go this way. And then in turn, you would take that initial state and the go this way, give that to the results function. The results function would say, okay, well, here's your new state. Then you put that in a new node, okay? And then from there, similar kind of thing happens again. So for this node here, its frontier is this guy right here. And so it generates it. From this node right here, its frontier is right here, right? And so on. And so you can see, kind of get a feel for how it can grow across that graph. And what's nice about this is that, you know, it's not a nice clean tree. The underlying light gray is the actual search space that's possible. Okay. And as the AI is thinking, right, this is, this is memory growing and it's examining each one of these leaf nodes as the structure grows, as the graph grows. Are you my target? Are you my target? Are you my target? My target, I mean, are you my goal? Are you my goal? Are you my goal? Um, because if this is the goal right here, what's the uh, solution? Well, go backwards, follow backwards, right? All the actions. What action led you to the goal? Well, it was the action that took you from this state to here, right? Um, and then you just recursively go back and do it again, do it again. Okay, so this is another view here. This is a view for um, graph search and shows you how it could progress and um, in a different different way, right? Just a different graphic, really. Just a different point of view, I suppose. So that's your initial um, state node. And then the frontier, you know, in the gray is the underlying possible search space or state space. And then, um, you know, these, these guys in your white circles, these white nodes, these are your frontier. So each one of these is going to get generated in turn, right? So in... Um, graphing B here, you know, this was the next node that got created, right? Um, and then here's its frontier, okay? And then for um, the uh, these other nodes, you'll notice that for this node, its frontier was this one, this one, and this one. But when this node gets created, right, this node to the right of the initial node, look at its frontier. It's only this one and this one, right? It You didn't generate that third node or you didn't you know, that's not, there's not a duplicate here, right? Because you would have said, well, is it already in my frontier or my explored set? Oh, it is. So when this node gets generated, it says, well, we're not gonna do that one again. Okay, that's what the graph search buys you, right? So you don't have any duplicates, um, nodes being examined. Okay, so infrastructure for search algorithms. So let's talk about this really quick. And I've already been talking about this in the example, right? So a data structure is needed to track the search tree construction, right? So struct node, right? Or class, OK? 
okay, uh, if you're thinking Java or Python, okay. So nodes are you know what make up the tree, what make up the graph. You know, as I was drawing all that stuff out. So in C++, you could write a struct. You know, in Python, you could create a class. In Java, you create a class. Um, what goes into that node? You know, struct node. What's the field? Right. So state would be one. Okay, however you choose to encode and represent the state. So you got that field. Parent. As I was saying, remember I was telling you, the pointers, how we follow the pointers backwards. So you got to keep track of um, the parent node. Action. The action that's applied to the parent that generates this child node. And then if there was a path cost, now in the examples, I didn't keep track of a path cost, right? Um, but the uh, path cost would be the result of um, that cost function. And the text refers to it as uh, G of N. So that is a cost, as they describe it here, of traveling from um, the initial node or the start node, which is holding the start state, um, to this most latest node that was generated, right? So you just added a node to the frontier, it was generated. And so the path cost is um, the cost of all the actions from the start node to this most recently created node. And you would store that path cost in the most recently created node. So each node in the tree has to keep track of the state that it's responsible for in the search space, or the parent node that caused it to get generated, the action that was applied to the state in the parent node that caused it to get generated, and then the cost it would you'd have to pay to get from the first state, which is in that parent node, to the node that we just generated, right? And this node that's keeping direct plus information. Okay, so figure 310, nodes, data structures, search tree constructed from them. Um, so what do they have, okay? So remember, this is weird, it's backwards. The nodes are keeping track of their parents, so that way you can construct the solution at the end. If this was the goal state node, we'd follow the pointers all the way up, recording the actions as we go. And then by the time you get to the, the root node, um, you've got all of your actions on a nice list. So that node is keeping track of who its parent is, not its children, who its parent is, some representation of the state. So this is the eight puzzle. Right, the sliding puzzle. So this would be representation of the state. Maybe it's a two-dimensional array. Maybe it's a one-dimensional array. Maybe it's bits. Whatever. It doesn't matter. Okay, some representation of it. The action that caused the state to come into being when applied to the state stored in the parent node. Okay, so the action that got us here was um, was right. Okay. Um, However, I'm trying to look at this puzzle. I'm like, how would you get to this by moving a tile to the right? I think they made a mistake in their graphic. Um, maybe four should have been over here or something, um, but whatever, right? So you got into this state by applying right onto your parents' actions or onto your parents' state, okay? And then uh, these are nodes that contain the states that were generated from passing this state into the actions function, right? Um, as I demonstrated. All right, so this algorithm right here is just telling you how you could create a whole separate function, a whole separate um, sub-program um, that would be responsible for creating these nodes, right? So what does this mean, okay? Um, this means that the algorithm would have to have in the code that you would write that implements that algorithm would have to have these things um, in scope, would have to have access to these things. The problem definition, remember what's the problem definition? Starting off the very, 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 very beginning, initial state, all the action, the, the definition for the action function, the definitions for the result function, definition for goal state function, right? So this child node function has to have access to all that stuff. Who your parent is, so the memory address of your parent node, and the action that caused you to get generated, okay? And then it returns a node. So, it returns a node with what? It's got a state field, okay? What goes into that state field? The parent state and the action that caused you to be created, right? So, you know, the parent state here plus the action. Where did the action come from? It came from the actions function, right? Why did it return this action? Because 
um, the parent state plus that action uh, was passed into the result function and fed into state. So where did that action come from again? The parent state was fed into the actions function and it returned a list of all the possible actions. Okay. So you're also storing who your parent is, what action caused you to get generated, and then your path cost. Okay. And so then to generate that function or to, to generate the solution, you can just create another function that just goes through, follow the pointers one after the other, right? Follow the links, follow the references, right? however you're chaining them together in whatever language you're choosing. Okay, so a couple more things here, then we'll, we'll call it a video, okay? So what structure do we store the nodes in? What do you use for the frontier? What do you use for the explored set? Okay, well, the textbook says use a queue. Now, this is confusing. If you've been reading the textbook, um, you know, they say, oh, well, let's use a queue. And they use that term to refer to both, you know, we're used to talking about a queue and a stack, right? You're, you're thinking that's more common. They use the word queue just to mean a storage space, really. And so they identify a FIFO queue. They talk about a FIFO queue and a LIFO queue, right? Well, you and I know of LIFO as being a queue. We call it first in, first out. That's a queue data structure. Last in, first out is a stack data structure. But for some reason in this textbook, they're like, yeah, everything's a queue. One's a, one, one's a type of queue where it's first in, first out, and one's a type of queue where it's last in, first out. Okay, we're just going to confuse the hell out of you. Um, but the, the idea here is that, you know, you know, you could use a queue and a stack. And so then you have to define the operations. Well, you can check if it's empty. Um, you know, pop to remove, remove the first element, return it, insert, add an element. Um, so, you know, if you were if you were coding this, you know, for a homework assignment or something like that, um, you know, let's say C plus plus. Let's say I was going to do it, uh, and I needed a, and I decided that I needed to use a queue. Okay, so if you use a queue, what you end up doing is you modify the algorithm so it's breadth first search. If you use a stack, then you're modifying the algorithm so that way it's a um, so that way it's a depth first search. Uh, but if I chose between Q and stack, how would I write that in my C++ code? Pound include stack. That's what I would do. Pound include Q. Don't reinvent the wheel. You don't have to write these data, that data structure from, from scratch. Reuse, you know, reuse the stuff that's in the library. Knock yourself out. Okay. Um, so that clarification again, nodes versus states. Okay. So the node is far is part of that search structure okay so you know node when we talk about node think about node from your traditional data structures class right you defined a node and then you stored information in the node okay and then uh, and then you added nodes to the tree or to the uh, linked list to store information in the structure right well it's the same kind of thing here the big difference is, is that the nodes for these searches are being generated dynamically on the fly you're not creating the whole structure first and then doing a search afterwards. You're doing it at the same time. Okay, that's that's the key thing to take away from this, right? So you're going to have your first major programming project. You're going to basically be implementing one of these algorithms. So don't do what you did from data structures, right? And create a giant old tree, populate it with uh, you know all the information, and then do the search separate as a two-part uh, process, like you did in your data structures class. If you do that, you won't get any points. Right? These data structures have to be generated as part of the search, right? They're, they're melded together. That's to maximize efficiency. Okay. Cause you don't need to generate an entire tree that represents or an entire graph that represents the entire state space in order to find a solution. It's wasteful. Okay. If you have any questions about that, you know, give me a holler and I'll, and I'll do my best to try to explain it another way. But so a node, we use that to represent a tree. What's a state? A state is a configuration of the world or of the environment, right? So a state in vacuum world, vacuum left square, left square dirty, right square clean, right? That state would have to be represented somehow as a string, as an integer, as a whatever. And then that information is stored inside a node. So the nodes contain the state. Nodes are on particular paths within the search tree. The states aren't. Separate nodes can contain the same state, 
right? That was the that was the reason we had possible problems with those loopy paths, and why you might need to have, you know, use the form of graph search instead of um, the tree search, because it is possible. Um, you might think about tic tac toe, right? If you're generating all the different states, you'd have um, you could end up in a state where you've got three X's in a row along the top row, right? But you'd have a couple different paths that could lead you there, right? Um, higher up in the search, maybe the X went in the upper left-hand square first, right? Um, and then that's along one path that leads to three in a row. But another path would have the X in the upper right-hand square, right? So both ways are going to eventually lead you both paths are eventually going to lead you to three in a row along the top row. Okay. So, you know, the nodes themselves are in particular paths, but states can be represented in multiple locations within the search space and therefore within the search tree and therefore along separate paths. All right. So I'm going to just do a couple more things here. Um, you know, how can we measure performance, right? So we can talk about, and we will um, a bit as we go on um, describing these different algorithms, we can talk about completeness of a particular algorithm. Well, what does that mean? If there's a solution, is it going to find it? Okay. Can we guarantee, will the algorithm be guaranteed to find the solution? If so, then it's, it's complete. Um, optimality. You know, there could be three different solutions, right? Three different sequence of actions that get you the tic-tac-toe three in a row. Did you get the optimal solution, right? Does the algorithm tell you the fewest moves it would take to get those three X's in a row? Is it optimal? And then just like any other algorithm, right? If you've taken your analysis of algorithms class or heck, even data structures, right? I talk about, um, you know, complexity analysis in that class, you know, time complexity, space complexity, how long? You know, and uh, how long does it take in terms of running time? And then how much memory does it take? You know, what's your big O in these, in these areas? Okay. All right. Um, something else here. Graphs are represented implicitly, right? Implicitly. So, you know, when we were going through and defining those problems, and we were talking about, well, here's your actions function, and here's your, here's your initial state, and your transition models, and all that. Right? We were describing a graph in a different way. We didn't draw it all out, you know, with zeros and square and uh, lines and all that, right? Nodes and edges. We were describing machinery or mechanisms for constructing that graph is what we were doing, right? So we had an initial state. Where was that? That was your start node, right? Actions. Well, those actions describe what lines can be drawn off a node in the graph, right? Transition models. We were describing there through the results function, what nodes are on the other edge or other, on the other side of that edge, okay? Um, complexity can also be measured in, and we're gonna definitely be using these terms also, branching factor. So what's that, okay? The maximum number of successors for any node. So, you know, a particular node contains state one, we feed state one into the actions function and it feeds us back or tells us, uh, you know, gives us a list of actions A, B, C, D, uh, E, right? Now, if that's the most actions that can ever be generated from any state in any node, that's your, that's your branching factor. The smaller the branching factor, um, the, depending on, let me, let me put it this way, depending on the size of the branching factor that you have, right? It's gonna determine um, the shape of the tree, right? If the maximum branching factor um, for any node is two, right? Then you're looking at, if you, if every single node generated two child nodes, you'd be looking at a binary tree, right? Um, if the maximum branching factor was say eight, then, um, you know, you'd have a tree that had a quite different shape. It could be potentially more flat. Um, depth, the shallowest goal node, maximum length, um, you know, the longest path. Uh, in the state space. Okay, how can we measure time? Number of nodes generated in the search? That'd be one way of putting it, 
right? Um, because you can't figure that allocating um, nodes and initializing them, you know, copying data and doing all that, you know, um, it's gonna be the same for every node, right? Because every node is gonna hold four pieces of information. So if you just count the number of nodes that are generating, so you can compare, you know, how many nodes get generated in this algorithm as opposed to how many nodes are generated in this other algorithm. Well, if nodes are take the same amount of time, um, you know, to be generated, no matter what algorithm is running them, well, then that'd be a good little shortcut to be able to determine the overall running time, you know, to eyeball it anyway, um, you know, as a basis for judging this, the efficiency of the two different algorithms. Uh, space, you could think of it as, well, what's the maximum number of nodes that are ever going to be stored in memory at one time, right? So that could be another way of discussing it. Right. If, if we have to generate 10,000 nodes with this algorithm, but at the at the uh, at the most, we only ever have to have three nodes in memory. Well, that's going to that's going to be an algorithm that runs for a pretty long time, but it doesn't take up much memory. Whereas opposed to another algorithm, well, the most number of nodes that this ever gets or that it ever generates is 100. Right. You're like, oh, wow, well, that's going to run a lot faster. But it, the most nodes that will ever be in memory at one time are 27. Wow, that's going to take up a lot more memory than, than the first algorithm. You see what I'm saying? All right. Um, so you can talk about the cost of the search. Well, you can say, well, you know, that, that's some combination of, um, you know, time and memory. Okay. So if you want to talk about the total cost, you know, you're coming up with some kind of measurement that's some combination of search cost and uh, path cost to help you identify your solution. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm going to finish this off. So finding the route between the cities, you know, what's the search cost? Example from the text. How much time does the search take to run? You know, solution cost. What's the total miles from, you know, your start city to your goal city, right? And what's the overall total time cost? Well, you or the total cost. We'll add up the time, whatever that value is, plus the distance, right? So that would be one way that you could get a more comprehensive measurement of a particular algorithm okay all right so that's that um so that algorithm that tree search algorithm and um that graph search algorithm were you know just examples of approaches okay now when we come back to the next video we're going to go into more detail and start naming some uh, search algorithms and and uh flesh them out a little bit more Right, because remember in tree search and graph search, she just said, pick a node from the frontier. Um, the order matters. The order ma has a huge impact on um, the overall performance of the algorithm. Okay, and uh, we can tweak the algorithms. Um, we can take one version of an algorithm, say breadth first search, right? And um, you, know, you can compare that against the depth first search. And you can say, all right, well, what are pros and cons of breadth first search against depth first search? Okay, fine. But that's not all you can do, right? You can modify breadth first search further to where you maybe end the search artificially early, right? To where you say, well, the, 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 your maximum depth that this tree, I'm going to allow this tree to be generated is uh, four, right? Um, and you're always having a balance, um, trying to balance an AI you know, rationality or effectiveness or intelligence against the resource requirements. Well, the main resources that we're fighting with or that we're, that we're, that we're working with, time and space, right? Um, you might make the smartest AI in the history of the world, but if it takes 4 million years to answer a single question or to move a pawn from one square to another, nobody's gonna play your game, okay? All right, so the last thing I wanted to do um, is I needed to do, I wanted to do one more example of generating a, a, a state space, okay? Wanted to do another example. So remember um, Vacuum World, okay? Vacuum World, um, let's, let's do that. Let's generate the state space for that, okay? So remember we had um, the possible actions, which were left, right, and suck. Right. And um, we had a description of, you know, what the states could look like, what the environment was like. 
you know, where you could have, you know, two spaces, you got the vacuum, and then you got dirt, okay? Um, and so what's our transition model, right? Well, our transition model is, you know, if you've got vacuum and left square, um, you know, the actions you can take are going to be right and suck and left. Okay. Um, left just bounces you back into the same square. Um, if, if you're in the right square, what are your actions? Left, right, and suck. So it doesn't matter what position you are within the squares. Um, you know, and if, uh, you know, you talk about your results function, if, uh, I'm in a state like this where the vacuum is in the left square and there's dirt in that square, right? So that would be like state one from our previous example, right? What are the possible actions from this state? Well, the possible actions would be left, right, and suck, right? Well, if I fed this state plus the suck action of the results function, what would I have? What would be the output? Right? Clean board with the back of the left square. What would have been the output if um, instead of sucking, we did the right action? Well, then that would have left the dirt in that square and would have left the uh, vacuum in the right hand square, right? So, so um, this is a description of the problem, okay? One thing more that I need is I need to describe what the goal state is. The goal state is to have a set of states where the floor is clean, right? So this is my goal state. Remember, goal states, goal states are set, right? And so, you know, in the previous examples, I was just, I had a set of one, right? But this is a set of two. Um, and then you have to set up what your initial state is, okay? So, you know, pick one for this example. So I'll just say um, dirt, dirt, okay? Um, so from there, if I want to build the state space by hand, right? and this is what uh, those algorithms that we just did, that's, that's what they do, okay? That's what, that's what those algorithms do when you write a program for them. Um, so if my initial state is vacuum cleaner, right? And I'll just do a dot for dirt, okay? So that way it'll be easier to read. Um, so what are the possible actions that I could take here? Well, I could go left, right? But if I go left, then I'm just gonna end up in the same spot. I'm just gonna hit the wall and then stay where I'm at. So I'll label that left. Um, I could go right, I could go to the right, okay? Now, if I go to the right, if I go to the right from this state, right, what's the result? Okay, dirt, dirt, and vacuum cleaner. Okay, now what's the other th action I could take from this initial state? Well, the next action would be to do sucking, right? And so what would be the resulting state? Boink, right? So if this was, you know, like the tree search algorithm, this was our initial state, these guys would have been generated in the frontier, okay? Uh, all right, so now let's process this one. What are the possible actions? Well, I can go left, in which case I'm bouncing against the wall, boink. Um, I could go right. And what's the resulting state there? Dirt here, I can clear there, that's going right. Um, but there's not, I can't suck here, can I, right? There's nothing to suck. I mean, there's, so that's not even, that's not even a valid action, right? You only suck when you, when you, de when you, uh, um, detect dirt. Uh, all right. So how about this action over here, right? What are the possible things I can do? Well, I can go, the vacuum cleaner can go right or bonk into the wall, right? which just leaves you back in the original state that you're in. Could go left. Right, which just moves you back over here, um, but you can also suck. Okay, what's the resulting state if I suck? Dirt here, and then uh, and then vacuum cleaner here. All right, so now let's go deal with this state. Um, what are the possible actions here? Well, I could go right, which would bonk into the wall. Could go left 
which would put me back in the previous state, or I could suck. Uh, let's see here. And if I suck, then that gets me into one of my goal states. Okay. Um, so now let's go handle this one. So I'm kind of doing a breath first search here, I think. So what are the possible actions here? Well, I can go right. Bonk. My actions function would have fed me right, you know, left and suck. Um, what if I go left? Okay. Well, if I go left, then... That would put me here, right? And I'm not going to suck because there's no dirt in this square, right? So that so that's actually not a valid action. So the only valid actions here are right and left. Um, I mean, if I wanted to say suck was a valid action, I mean, it would just be a loop going back to the same state. All right, so let's deal with this one. So what are the valid actions from from this from this state? Well, I could go left, right? In which case, I would end up here. Um, I could go right, in which case, I bonk into the wall. Okay, that's it. And sucking, there's nothing to suck. Um, what about valid actions here? Well, I could go right, which would take me back. Okay, um, if I go left, I walk into the wall. And then if I suck, I end up here. Okay, so this is my state space. So if I wanted, um, and this was my initial state, right? So if I wanted to have a clean floor, what would be the series of actions that I would have to take, right? Um, I'd have to make sure that I get into a square or into a state where both squares are clean, right? So the optimal solution would be, could be, you know, if we can follow the, we can go backwards like we did in the, in the search examples, right? If we ended up here, you know, there would have been left and then suck. Um, and then, uh, left and then suck okay so then that would be our solution wouldn't it suck left suck left so we start here we do a suck right left square is now clean and then um oh i did it i i did i followed the wrong arrow so let's do that again you probably saw that as you're watching it so i'm here Right? I got to follow the arrows that are pointing to me. <laughs> okay. Um, anyway, so left. Okay. Um, and then uh, suck. Okay. And then right. And then suck. So I was only off by one. So that would be my solution. If I'm starting here, if this is my initial state, suck, that cleans that square. Then we transition to this state. And then right, okay, that moves back to the right square, transitioning into this state, and then suck, right? That transitions into this state, okay? And then um, left, okay? And we detect that there's no dirt there. Um, so we're, we're, we're done, right? So that right there is a solution. And it's I think it's the optimal solution too, um, because you can have another solution. I mean, what if... Um, Instead of suck right, suck left, you used to had um, right, left, left, right, left, suck, left, right, 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 suck, <laughs> um, right, 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 left. You'd still end up with a solution that would get you your clean floor but it'd be far less uh, efficient, right? And so that would not be the optimal solution. And so if that was possible, then this algorithm, that algorithm that generated that solution would not be optimal because it wouldn't have found you know, either the optimal solution. Okay, but anyway, so this right here is the complete state space for vacuum world, okay? So for, for your homework assignment, I'll be looking for something like this.
this would be great. You know, if I handed it to you and I said, hey, here's um, Vacuum World, um, generate for me the state space, uh, describe for me the initial state, um, you know, the possible actions, uh, the um, state information, the transition model, and then draw a diagram of the state space. If you gave me something like this, um, you know, you'd be good. The, uh, the thing is, is that, you know, you'd have to flesh all this out. Because you know, I only have limited real estate here, and um, you know I'm, I'm using abbreviations. Don't do that, because if my grader looks at it, and they're like, "What the hell's ST with the little blank thing?" I don't, I don't know what the hell that is. Um, TM, huh? You, know, you got to use like complete sentences and stuff. I didn't use complete sentences because I'm right here to explain what I mean, right? Um, but when we're reading your stuff, you're not going to be there to explain what your abbreviations mean. So, you know, assume that you're handing in that assignment to somebody on the street. Right. And, um, you know, if they can read it without you having to talk to them about it, then it's, it's probably going to be good. OK. And I'll have a rubric for you, too, to help guide you. Uh, all right. Anyway, so there you go. That's going to be your that's going to be the, the, the end of this video. Um, hopefully it wasn't too bad. Hopefully I didn't run too long. I mean, hit pause a few times, so I'm not sure how long I actually ran. Um, let's see here. What else do I want to say? Uh, all right, so when we come back, um, what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at um, we're going to take a look at uninformed search strategies. Sorry, I told you this, right? So we're going to we're going to dig into those search algorithms a little bit more detail, and then uh, we'll finish up by talking about un, uh, informed search strategies. So uninformed search strategies behave similar to what we just did. You know, they're not they're not in, they're just kind of a brute force type algorithm. There's nothing guiding um, the progression of the algorithm, the progression of the search, other than the order in which you pull things out of the frontier, essentially. But with um, informed search strategies, we'll add a function that can help um, shove the search in certain directions, hopefully make it more efficient. Okay. All right. If you have any questions, you know, you know, you know how to get a hold of me. Um, hopefully I was clear. Let me know how I'm doing. Uh, if you have any problems, any suggestions, I'm open. Um, you know, let's, we're in a weird situation with COVID-19. So uh, let's stay safe, but uh, let's work together. Okay, it's a partnership. All right, thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.